Hello and welcome to this 360 degree virtual reality video of the Ard Peninsula and North Down in County Down. We're going to be exploring the legacy of Ulster Scot settlers in this area over the centuries, thinking about their history, their heritage, their culture and their landscape. Now the scene that you're looking at today has been captured using a 360 degree virtual camera. And that means that you can look around with me using your mouse at home or a VR headset. And today you're looking at the beautiful little village of Kirkcobbin, situated here in a bay on the east coast of Strangford Loch. If you look to my left, you're going to see a map that shows you exactly where Kirkcobbin is located. So the origins of Scottish settlement in this area lie with a man called Alexander Bailey and he came from Wigtonshire in Scotland. If you look this time to my right, you'll see a map showing you where Wigtonshire is. Alexander Bailey arrived in Ulster in 1628. Now he was a fugitive from the law in Scotland. We have an old commentary that records his arrival here. Let me read a little bit to you. By the edge of Strangford rode this son of the Baileys, up a hill to an old chapel. On top of this hill, almost surrounded by water, he brought his horse to a halt. For a moment he stood, silhouetted black against the sky. Then, slowly dismounting, he stuck his sword into the ground and said, Here will I mark my home. Alexander Bailey purchased the land for his home from another Scotsman, the landlord of this area, Sir James Hamilton, who had arrived over here in the early 1600s. And if you look again to my left, you'll see a portrait of Sir James Hamilton. So back here in Inishargi townland, Alexander Bailey now built himself a substantial house. He drained the swampy bogs all around and began to produce rich agricultural fields for farming. If you look to my right hand side, you'll see an image that shows the location of Inishargi House. The Bailey family remained influential here in this area for several generations. And it was, it was actually the great, great grandson of Alexander, James Bailey, who established the village of Kirkcobbin that we see here in 1769. He built the little houses, he invited in Ulster Scott settlers, and he also developed this old stone pier or harbour that we're standing on. Now, if you could imagine back in the day, a lot of great wooden sailing ships would have tied up using these old capstans on the pier, importing and exporting goods. This was a busy and thriving little area. James Bailey obtained permission to hold four annual fairs here and a series of weekly markets. Some of the goods that they might have been selling at those markets were straw, hats and bonnets, because that was an industry which thrived here. The people of Kirkcobbin bought in straw from England and then they produced this beautiful headwear and they sold it in England and in Belfast and in Dublin. In fact, this straw hat and bonnet industry was so successful, it was bringing the people of Kirkcobbin an annual income of £10,000, which is equivalent to about £900,000 in today's money. They were also busy producing linen. In the fields around us, they were growing flax. The flax would then be harvested. The ladies in their homes would spin the flax into linen yarn or linen thread, and their husbands would weave that. The looms were busy as they were pro producing this beautiful linen cloth and selling that to the merchants and the drapers. There were about a thousand webs of cloth being produced here at the turn of the 19th century. Following industrialization then in the 1830s, the women discovered that they could actually make more money as needle workers. Glasgow merchants and Belfast merchants were sending cloth to Kirkcubbin and the greater district and the ladies here were doing beautiful needlework. Young girls were doing little delicate easy stitches whereas older women had the skill of tambouring or embroidering with hoops. They would create these beautiful pieces and send them off then to the merchants. As many as 3,000 ladies were sewing for Belfast merchants and 10,000 women locally were sewing for Glasgow merchants. So this really was an Ulster Scots industry. I want you now to take a little look to my left and you'll see a gorgeous old image of a woman sitting tambouring, working at her hoop. So 
So these needleworking skills had originally arrived in the Ards Peninsula area as far back as 1606, the dawn of the Ulster Scots. The Montgomery manuscripts, were, which were written about that period, record the old women spun and the young girls plied their nimble fingers at knitting and everybody was innocently busy. Today there are still needleworkers plying their skill at the hoops and the looms on the Ards Peninsula and we're going to head inland now to meet Christine Casey of Kerry Crafts. So now we have come inland. We're about four miles from the coast here, just outside Kirkcubbin, in the beautiful, colourful crafts workshop of Christine Casey, who is a skilled needleworker and maker here on the Ards Peninsula. At the harbour, we were talking about how the Ulster Scots ladies 400 years ago were plying their nimble fingers at needlework, and their skills and traditions are certainly being kept alive nowadays by Christine and others in this area. We were talking about tambouring, this is a tambour hoop I have in my hand. Christine, can you tell us a little bit more about this skill? Yes, I certainly can. This would have been the type of embroidery that, as, as Lolly says, would have been carried out at the time. It's basically a chain stitch. Those of you who have maybe learned embroidery at school would remember a chain stitch, but a fairly basic piece of embroidery. Um, and a piece of tambour work would have been made by creating outlines with the chain stitch and then filling it in with other coloured threads. Um, I've got embroidery thread here, it could be nearly anything, because very often what was used was metallic thread, maybe with beading to create very ornate, very often birds, plants, flowers, uh, really beautiful pieces of embroidery. Thank you very much indeed, Christine. And of course, what is this you're doing? You're working with a spinning wheel. I'm working with a spinning wheel. It's really a very nice modern spinning wheel. Um, there's still a few traditional wheels around, but this is a nice German wheel, a nice fresh modern one. But I have over here an example of an old traditional wheel, which is a flax wheel, which would have been the type of wheel that, that we use, was used in the time period we're talking about. That wheel at the moment is dressed with flax um, on the distaff, which is a piece of, of wood in this case, that the, the flax is tied onto and you'll see there's a, a coloured ribbon tying it on, pink ribbon. Um, in those days the type of ribbon, the colour of ribbon you had denoted perhaps your marital status. Maidens or young ladies wanting or looking for a man would maybe have it had a blue or a green ribbon and the old married woman like me would have had a pink or a red one. So a lot of a lot of unspoken communication could be involved in, in these old crafts as well. But as I say that's a traditional one, possibly what they termed a parlour wheel for a slightly more affluent young lady. Um, nicely turned spokes on the wheel, brass fittings on it, and I see the white bits are bone, and there may be little connectors or tighteners for various parts of the wheel. But altogether, a very ornate wheel, dating from the late 1800s, and as I say, would have been used within the industry at that stage. I bought it in a lovely second hand shop in Belfast, a very unusual find. What about this piece of equipment beside it? What's this, a, a loom? That's a loom, yes, no, that's, that's a much more modern piece of equipment. This is made by a company called Ashford from New Zealand and it's a flat pack. It just comes in a big box and you put it together. But it still is a very functional piece of equipment. Um, what I have on it at the moment, the threads, the grey thread you can see going from front to back is the weft and that's a hand spun yarn. And then I'm weaving um, a hand spun, hand dyed yarn as the weft thread. Eventually it will become a scarf. When I sit down long enough and do it, it will become a scarf. Um, so that's, yes, that's a loom. So you're talking about all this yarn that you're using to weave, yeah. and I see you've got all kinds of different yarns in the workshop. Different yarns, yes, and my little unit up here, just over on the right-hand side where the open door is on the right-hand side of the unit, I have hand-spun Old English Sheepdog hair. Um, old English Sheepdog hair from a really, well, a dog that's well-known in Ireland. He's the, the Dulux dog. You'll see him when you watch the Irish versions of the Dulux advert. That's, that's a guapo in the adverts. And the owner is a lovely gentleman and I have spun wool and knit him. He has a lovely jacket and a jumper and his wife has a dress, all spun out of their dog's hair. And then over to the left hand side of the unit up at the top, there's wool I have created. There was three, three different types of sheep, but all natural colours just to show um, how you can blend the colours together. Below that, again, you can see various other hand dyed pieces of wool. So this is sheep's wool you're, we, you're sheep's spinning wool. now, but you've got some alpaca wool there as well, I have, have alpaca, you? yes, I have some alpaca here. 
There's different colours of alpaca. There's black. Alpacas come in a range of different colours, whites, gingers of all sorts, and black. So these are donations to me, which is lovely. People give me things like this, which is very handy. People also give me sheep's wool as well. This is Galway fleece. Um, that's fleece. I've washed that. Usually I, I would traditionally have spun sheep fleeces in the raw, in the grease, as they call it, without washing them because they're a lot easier. The lanolin in the wool makes it a lot easier. But I was running workshops and these days you can't be too careful with people handling things like lanolin. So it was all washed nicely for a pegling workshop. But um, as you can see, this that I am spinning at the moment is commercially washed, carded or combed. And when you compare it to the quality of that, you can see this is a lot easier to spin. Mm -hmm. And the spinning is more fun than the preparation. Yes. There's something really nice about sitting here in a workshop, listening to the rain outside, the gentle hum of the spinning wheel. It reconnects us with the Ulster Scots who had these very same experiences 400 years ago. If you would like to learn more about Christine's work here, you can go onto her website. You'll see that at the end of the episode. And now you might just like to have one final look around this beautiful, busy place with its wheels, its loom, its fabrics, its textiles. And then you might like to continue on some of the further episodes in this series. For now, we'll just fade out to the sound of Christine's spinning wheel.